Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, good afternoon. A very special welcome to all of you, and a very special welcome to Pastor Olson and his family and his friends. Today, uh, we have the privilege of installing Pastor Olson here at Christ Lutheran. God has richly blessed this day, and we're privileged to sit here and to worship and to sing God's praises as we ask God's blessings on his continued ministry. Today, the order of service is printed out for you. You can follow along also on the screens in front of you. Please join with me in the opening invocation. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the one true God of heaven and earth, God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier. Amen. Amen. And please stand. Almighty God, look with favor on all those whom you have called to minister to your people. Fill them with sound doctrine and clothe them with the holiness of life that they may joyfully serve to the glory of your name and for the benefit of your church. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And please stay standing for our opening hymn.
Please be seated. Let's give our attention to God's word that comes to us. We have two scripture readings today. The first one is taken from Romans chapter 12, as Paul urges us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God in our work, in our home life, and in our fun life as well. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And this is the word of our God. Our children's choir will now come forward and sing an anthem, God Gave.
Our second reading from God's Word is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2. Here Paul encourages us as a congregation and encourages pastors with the assurance that we do not speak our own words, but we speak God's words. And as Pastor Olson begins his ministry here, this congregation is assured that as we move forward, we move forward with the message of Christ and Christ crucified and risen from the grave. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or with human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, wisdom but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. The things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. This is the word of our God. Please join in our next hymn, Speak, O Lord.
The lesson that we are going to consider for today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, starting at verse 14, it gets into chapter 4. It, it reads, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever walked into a room in your house and paused and thought to yourself that you have absolutely no idea why you walked into that room? <laughs> and so you turn around and go back to whatever it was you were doing and you don't tell your wife about it because you don't want her to think that you're in the early stages of dementia and then all of a sudden it hits you. That's right, I went into the garage because I needed this to do that. Whether we are working on a project at home or if we are at work, we always need to know what we are doing so that we can get the job done. It's the same when it comes to our job as Christians and your job as a pastor here, Josh. Why are we here? Why are you here? I mean, Jesus already died on the cross for you. He could have ended your life already and taken you to heaven, but he has you here right now for a reason. Why? And I'm sure you got a job description when you got the call here and you talked with a number of members about what your job here would be like. Maybe it was a list of several things. Maybe it was a thousand things. But the Apostle Paul really condenses that for us today. And we're going to look at just a few imperatives, a few commands that the Apostle Paul gives to a young pastor named Timothy. So the book of 2 Timothy is the very last letter that Paul would write. It's considered his last will and testament. He was in prison, in chains, writing this letter, and he knew somehow that he was not going to make it out of here alive, and he didn't. And so he knew this was his last opportunity as a mentor to this other young pastor to give him some final words of wisdom. And so he shares with Timothy a number of imperatives. Here's the first one. It says this in verse 14. Continue in what you have learned. Since Timothy was a child, he had grown up in God's word. It was his mother and his grandmother who Paul actually calls out by name as Lois and Eunice as two people who built him up in God's word, taught him God's word from a very early age, and it made him wise for salvation, it says specifically. You know, parents can teach their kids a lot of things. We can teach them how to shoot a jump shot, how to hunt, how to fish, how to read, how to cook how to have a good work ethic. And, and as a parent, if you're a parent, it's something that maybe excites you. It excites me to be able to share with my kids some knowledge that I have. But all the different information we have to share with our children can only help them with this life or their career or their family in just the span of our lifetime. Except for one bit of information. God's Word. God's Word. That's different. In verse 16, it says this about God's, where it says, All scripture is God-breathed. That is, this is the one bit of information that comes straight from God. And it makes it different. It makes it unique. Uniquely useful. Uniquely beneficial. It goes on to say, 
It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, and righteousness. It's useful, it's beneficial, not just for this life, but it takes us into eternity. And so today we get to start our day by praising God for the gift of his word that he gave to us. And we praise God for the gift of parents or friends and family members who shared God's word with you so that you could be here today with faith. But why would Paul have to encourage a pastor to continue in what he had learned? I mean, we're pastors. We're in God's word all day long. We, we work throughout the week to prepare a sermon that is based off of God's word. We prepare Bible studies that are based off of, of course, the Bible. We go share God's word with our members who are in the hospital or at home. We share with them God's word. God's word is not just for a pastor to share to somebody else. Just as a waiter in a restaurant also needs to eat food and not just serve it to others, just as a doctor needs to care about his own health and not just the health of his patients, so a pastor has to continue in what he has learned. And there's good reason for that. Because Satan tempts us all. He doesn't draw the line at pastors. He tempts all of us. In fact, you might even say that he puts a specific focus on pastors because he knows that if you can take down a pastor, it's going to affect the spiritual lives of a lot more people. And nothing would make Satan happier than to have in his trophy case in hell a pastor. He's got us in the crosshairs. He's got all of us in his crosshairs. So Paul says, continue in what you have learned. Because this word of God, it makes us wise for salvation. It makes us wise. That is, it helps us to see what we can't see with our own eyes, what we can't feel with our body. It tells us the truth of what God sees. And that's what we all need. Because it could be you or any of you who are struggling with guilt because of something that you did. And it's God's word that reminds us that your Savior, Jesus, came into this world and through his death and through his resurrection removed that guilt completely. It could be you or any one of you who has a bad health diagnosis. And it's God's word that reminds you that when you are feeling weak, your strength is found in your God. And it might be you or any one of you who is filled with worry and anxiety, but it's God's word that reminds you that your God has you and this entire world in the palm of his hand so that you never have to worry about anything, ever. And it might be you someday, and it'll be all of us someday. We're finally on our deathbed. And it's God's word that dangles in front of us eternal life. A life where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And where the rest of the world sees our life is about to end, God's word reminds us that our life is just about to begin. And so continue in what you have learned. It's not about what we see. It's about what God's truth is. It makes us wise for salvation. I go to the doctor about once a year. And uh, for a few years there, the doctor would sit me down and say, you know, Dan, we really need to start talking about cholesterol medicine here. <laughs> and I said back to him, nah, I don't need any of that stuff. Don't bother. I'm just fine. I feel fine. And it was a few years ago where he finally said, it's time. You need to go on this cholesterol medicine. And I said, fine, I'll do it. I'll do it for six months and we'll meet again. And we'll see how it goes. And so uh, six months later, I'd come back. I'd say, I feel just fine. I feel just as fine as I did six months ago. And then he pulled out the blood work for me. My cholesterol had plummeted. You see, it was never about how I felt. It was about what was going on on the inside. And God's word is the same way. It's not about what we see. It's not about what we feel. It's about what the Holy Spirit's doing on the inside through this word. So continue in what you have learned. 
He goes on in the next chapter, in chapter 4, and he gives another imperative. He says, preach the word. But he doesn't just say, preach the word. No, he prefaces that with a strong encouragement, to say the least. This is what he says. This is in uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. He doesn't just say preach the word. He says, one day you're going to stand in front of the living God, Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and you're going to have to give an account for what you preach at this pulpit. Preach the word. All of it. And he put pressure on Timothy as he says these words, on this pastor, as he says these words, make sure he preaches all of God's word, because Paul knew that there's another influence in the world that tempts us to not preach all of God's word. And that's what he gets into in the very next verse, verse 3 and verse 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. There's so much in the Bible that people don't like to hear. The Bible is a very countercultural message. In fact, Christianity is exactly that. It's a very humbling thought, Christianity. It says, unlike any other religion, that you aren't good enough. And that's why you need a savior. In that sense, Jesus is the worst motivational speaker ever. He's saying, you can't do it. That's why I came into this world. And no one likes to hear that they're sinful. No one likes to hear that they're not good enough. The message of God's word, it is in so many parts countercultural. And that's why Paul says people will turn aside to myths and believe what they want to hear rather than what the truth is. People don't like to hear today God's design for marriage and sex. People don't like to hear about the reality of the existence of hell because they can't wrap their minds about a loving God who would possibly send anyone there. People don't want to believe in what the Bible says in Genesis 1 about he created the world in six 24-hour days because of the teaching of evolution in our society. And I'm guessing that there are a number of people in this room who struggle with different teachings of the Bible, maybe some of these that I mentioned. And I will admit that it would make my life a lot easier, and it would make his life, your new pastor, a lot easier if some of these passages were just weren't there. But they are. And our job is to preach the word, all of it even if it makes some people uncomfortable at times. I know there's some people when they do church shopping, they look for a church that has the same beliefs and same values as they have, but that's not how we look for a church. We look for a church that preaches the truth of God's word, all of it, even the parts that make us uncomfortable. But God's word, unabridged, is beautiful and powerful. Even the parts of it that make us uncomfortable. You think about what God says about, about marriage and sex in the Bible. That he doesn't just give us that to tell us what is right and what is wrong. But he gives you that because he knows that if you follow this design, your life will just be better. It will be. And if you struggle to love your spouse, because he's not always the sharpest knife in the drawer, God's word tells you how you have a savior who loved this world in spite of who we were. If you look at the teaching of creation that's in the Bible, if you struggle with evolution, read Genesis 1 again. And there you'll see that the Bible, or that, that this world really does revolve around us. He created all of it for you and me, the different colors and tastes and views and experiences that he gives in this world is for you and me. And then the sixth day he created mankind, his magnus opus, different than every other creature that he made in this world. He created us in the image of God. And when that image broke in the Garden of Eden through Adam and Eve's sin, God did everything to restore it and fix it to the point of sacrificing his own son for you and me. And I know people struggle with the doctrine of the existence of hell because how could a loving God send people there? But that teaching reminds us of how great this rescue plan really was. We were rescued from something awful. 
And your God didn't even want to send two people, Adam and Eve, there. I mean, he could have destroyed this world completely after Adam and Eve sinned, but he didn't even want to send two people there. And so he went through this entire plan of salvation for them, to rescue them, to rescue us. And Christianity as a whole, I know it's, it's a humbling thought to know that we aren't good enough and that somebody else had to come for us, but look at it from the other angle. What a beautiful thought. That your Savior did it all for you. To take that burden off of you, that responsibility off of you, so that there's nothing more that needs to be done. He cried out from the cross, it is finished, so that you can know that your sins are forgiven, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you have done. God's word, all of it, is beautiful and powerful. Even the parts of it that at times seem uncomfortable. So preach the word. Continue in what you have learned. Preach the word. And there's one other command that I want to focus in on here. It's the very last one. He says, keep your head in all situations. See, the Apostle Paul knew as he is in prison, knowing that he is about to die, that Timothy was going to be faced with a lot of difficulties too. And you will be as a pastor. You will be as a congregation. And Paul says, keep your head in those situations. Remember what your job is. You know, if Paul would have just not preached all of God's word, he wouldn't have ended up there in prison and on death row. But he doesn't say to Timothy, don't do what I did. He doesn't do what any other convict in our society would say as they're giving the advice to somebody in the outside world. They typically would say, don't do what I did. Don't live like me. But that's not what Paul said. He said, do what I did. And you might end up in here. Preach the word, all of it. Continue in what you have learned. It's that important. And everybody in here and everybody out there is struggling with something or knows someone who is. Either you are mourning the loss of a loved one or you know someone who is. Either you struggle with anxiety and depression and worry or you know someone who is. Either you suffer from loneliness or you know someone who does. Either you're struggling with the temptation or you know someone who does. And so the Lord gave you this word, God's word. To continue in what you have learned, that's for you. That's where God's word has to work first, right here. And then preach the word because others around you need it. God's blessings to all of you here at Christ and to you, Pastor Olson as you take God's word to these people and to this community. Amen. We'll continue with an anthem by the choir.
this time, I'd ask Pastor Olson to please come forward. Our Lord and Savior said to his church, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Holy Scripture assures us that our risen and ascended Lord will always provide the church with the gifts necessary to carry out this great commission. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Christ ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Dear brother in Christ, this congregation has called you to serve in the office of the holy ministry. It is good that you should hear again what God in his holy word impresses on his pastors concerning this sacred office. St. Paul states that a pastor must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into the disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the final chapter of his second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul gives additional words of encouragement. Preach the word, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of, the, of an evangelist. The ability to carry out this calling is not in us, but comes from God alone. As St. Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. And so in keeping with the word and the will of the Lord, you are about to be installed as pastor here at Christ Lutheran in Eden Prairie. I ask you in the presence of God and of this congregation, are you fully determined to carry out this work according to the grace which God will give? If so, say, I am. I am. <clears throat> Do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and the New Testaments are the inspired, inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the three ecumenical creeds, the apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian as faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures, and do you reject all the errors which they condemn? If so, say, I do. And do you believe that the unaltered Augsburg Confession is a true exposition of the Word of God and a correct presentation of the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and that the other confessions in the Book of Concord are also in agreement with the scriptural faith, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Small and Large Catechism, Kittums, Kisms of Martin Luther, the Small Card Oracles, and the Formula of Concord? If so, say, I do. And do you solemnly promise that all your teaching and administration of the sacraments will conform to the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran confessions? If so say, I do. I do. Will you give faithful witness to Christ in all the world that God's love may be known in all you do and say? If so, say, I, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you strength and compassion to perform them. 
Brothers and sisters of this congregation, you have heard the solemn promise given by the one you have called to be your pastor. I urge you, therefore, to receive him as your pastor and keep in mind what the word of God expects of you as members of his flock. To listen eagerly to the preaching of the word, receiving it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God. To work together with him for the Lord's kingdom, so that by your works of service, the body of Christ might be built up. To help him by your word and example in teaching the youth, remembering how the scriptures urge you to bring up your children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Honor him and love him. As the Apostle Paul says, Respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. Pray for him continually, that his ministry among you might be greatly blessed. Provide for his physical needs, as the Lord says, a worker deserves his wages. And finally, remember what the scriptures say. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. I now ask you, in the presence of God, are you willing to receive your pastor as a minister of the word of God? Will you show him love, honor, and obedience in the Lord? If so, as a congregation, answer, we will and we ask God to help us. We will and we ask God to help us. Josh Olson, I install you as pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work committed to you that you may faithfully proclaim the gospel in word and sacraments. Josh, uh, you moved your family across Apostle Peter once asked this question, what do we get, Jesus? He left everything for you. And in Mark chapter 10, he said, truly I tell you that whoever leaves house and home, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, fields and, and, and property to protect the gospel will receive a hundred times more here on this earth. Along with persecution, he said also eternal life. And uh, Josh, you and I have known each other for quite a long time. Uh, back in high school, I got to live at your house a couple summers. I even dumped his motorcycle once and he forgave me. Um, <laughs> but I, I thought about that passage today and I think about how in my own life I, I, I grew up in Nebraska and my parents sent me away to high school in Wisconsin and uh, you and your family took me in and you and my mom and my dad and my brothers and my sisters and uh, this congregation here is the fulfillment of that promise once again to be to your family members and believe that with all your heart and believe that this is your brother sister and your kids are, are, are brothers here as well. And, um, and I'm so thankful that I'm just down the road now and, and I got my brother back. I, when, when Josh refused to call, I called him up and we just started joking like we had years ago and, and I'm so grateful for the relationship that Josh gave me. So the Lord bless you and your calling and, and I'm so grateful that he has given you brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers here today. God bless you. So let's 
Because of the word of the Apostle Paul, please let us good place here. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God bless you, God. I'm the Olson Pastor of St. Matthew, a Lutheran in Africa. I'm also the oldest of the brothers. As I drove in today, I thought, boy, it sure is different, huh? Um, city different. Psalm 46, it's almost considered a, a mountain where, the, where a world where the mountains have fallen and the heart is moved, where everything is flipped on its head. And yet there's one thing that keeps coming back to over and over again. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 46, The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord, the blessings on your name. Amen. I probably should have introduced, introduced myself before I preached for 17 minutes or so. Um, I'm Dan Olson. I am his other brother. Sir, at St. Paul's Lutheran in Onalaska, Wisconsin. Um, as I sat down, I realized I forgot a paragraph in my sermon. It's really bothering me. Um, so, <laughs> but it, it had to do with not only preaching the word, but preaching with great patience and careful instruction. And so this, again, from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4, where he says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience. Josh from uh, Saints at Mount Olive in Shock City. I know that uh, folks here in Christ have been waiting for a year and a half to let them come to them as we have served them. And so, since you've been your ministry here, I just wanted to extend my help and aid to you as just uh, someone, a brother down the street. And uh, I look forward to working with you and serving God's kingdom. And as you are a blessing to this congregation, May the God of peace and through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back uh, from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, be equipped you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in you what is pleasing in his sight, for his will be the glory forever and ever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome. Gosh, uh, nice meeting you today. And uh, what a blessing. I, I know. personally applies that to you and he applies that to your people. And he says that they'll be taken away and sins will stand forth. And that is your blessed message to proclaim from the pulpit and to God's people individually as we minister to them. May that be in this gospel song that lifts us up and restores us to the Lord. May that always be in the hearts and souls of your elected. And may you make your ministry Fill them with peace and turn many hearts to the Lord to do what He is. We always remember those words from Isaiah 6, chapter 7. The 
Lord has taken away your sin. Your guilt is going to be coming. Brother Josh, greetings from the saints who serve and are served at West Lutheran High School in Plymouth, Minnesota. What a privilege to be by your side as we serve this community together. Although ministry is hard work. challenges and with the accomplishments from the Lord, he reminds you of one thing, one more imperative today from the great resurrection chapter that gives us joy and confidence in all that we do from 1 Corinthians 15 58 Stand firm Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in him is not in vain Schmaller from Martin Luther College, serve as a professor there. Greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ there as well. I'm excited for you and excited for the congregation and the ministry that you are embarking on here. Excited for myself as well to have a, a friend and former classmate that's so close by. When I read your biography and I thought about the memories that we had in class together in Latin and, and German <coughs> and music classes, I think about why those are good memories because those things help to point us to the love of Christ. And as Paul is writing his letter to the Ephesians, he reminds them that this really is the core of what we do and who we are. It's all in the love of Christ, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And so at the end of that chapter, as Paul is closing his prayer, he leaves them with a blessing, knowing that as their future was unknown, and like you and your ministry, it's unknown here too, we have a God that we do know, who can do immeasurably more than we all we ask or imagine. So from Ephesians chapter 3, 19 and 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Josh, welcome. Uh, Stephen Camille, just across the river. Uh, looking forward to getting to know you, uh, working together here. Uh, we spend all kinds of time uh, crafting God's word, studying, translating, uh, preparing sermons. Bible studies uh, take the time also to hear that the good news is for you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy uh, are of the same family. And Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. Brother Josh, you're, you're finally here. Welcome. We've been waiting a long time. You're such a blessing to this church and to this congregation. You know, uh, you're an experienced pastor, and as you've moved here and as you've gotten to know the, the great people here at uh, Christ Lutheran, uh, fear is probably not an emotion that you're really feeling as you start your ministry. But there, there are certainly things to fear in our world today. There's a, a pandemic going on. Uh, our, our country seems to be divided more than ever, and uh, there's a temptation to be, to be guided by that fear. And so I, I wanted to encourage you with God's word from 1 John chapter 4, not to be guided by fear, but to be guided by the love and the grace of God. 1 John chapter 4, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Blessings on your ministry. O oh Lord God, dear Father in heaven, I am indeed unworthy of the office and ministry in which I am to make known your glory and to nurture and serve this congregation. But since you have appointed and called me to be a pastor and teach, and your people are in need of the teachings and the instructions, O oh, be my helper and let your holy angels attend me. Then if you are pleased to accomplish anything through me, to your glory and not mine, or to the praise of men, grant me 
out of your fine grace and mercy a right understanding of your word, and that I may also diligently perform it. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, shepherd and bishop of our souls, send your Holy Spirit that he may work with me and in me to will and to do your good pleasure through your divine strength. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing hymn, O Church Arise. Well, it is so great to be here and to meet all you. I'm sure I'll meet you all later today as well. Uh, my wife and I will be in the back uh, with a re receiving line there, and we'll greet you as you come in. There's some snacks and some fellowship in the gym today, I believe. So stick around if you have the chance to be here. That'd be great. Thank you so much for all the work, the choir directors, Pastor Krieger for putting together the service, the Sunday school director, the adult choir director, all the pastors for being here. Thank my brother for preaching, um, and everyone else for being here this afternoon. It's so great to have so many of you here, here today. Uh, we're very excited. We're also very cold, but we'll get used to that. 
the excitement outweighs the cold, so um, we can always put more. So anyways, but uh, we're excited to get to, get to know all of you and uh, excited to work together.